Today what I want to talk about is what is called cultural relativism. Cultural relativism is a theory and it's a theory that says that standards of morality, standards of normality, standards of rationality or reasonableness, and standards of beauty are created by, dependent on, and relative to each culture. And that each culture is the final court of appeal for what qualifies as morally right, uh, normal, rational, or beautiful within the confines of the culture. And uh, there's a, I could give you a background in this, which I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do. Uh, let me just say this, that in the 19th century, uh, there was more and more uh, discovery of different uh, cultures, including cultures, uh, including various tribes that were to some degree socially isolated on various um, islands. And, it, and there were a number of scientists, social scientists, and especially anthropologists, who, who came to find out how these people were living and how they were living in some cases was very different from uh, the way in which uh, most Western modern people uh, have been living. And they noted these differences. In the 19th century, more and more people came to understand the extent to which people are influenced by their cultures and by history and historical factors. And there was much uh, more concern with the influence of history. And there, in fact, one of the most uh, prominent philosophers uh, in uh, Western civilization was Hegel, the German philosopher Hegel. And Hegel's philosophy has a lot to do with the dynamics of history. Uh, and the, and, but in any event, let me just say this. Uh, what I'm going to do is uh, get you to understand that Ruth Benedict was a prominent anthropologist. And as she wrote, for example, in Japanese culture. But she's also um, well known for her defense of cultural relativism. In this article that we have, it's called Anthropology and the Abnormal. So it's talking about two um, aspects of cultural relativism. That I, I mentioned before that said cultural relativism includes a form of ethical relativism. In other words, it says that standards of right and wrong are relative to each culture. And also, it includes normality relativism, that standards of normality are going to be relative to each culture. Okay. And by the way, someone's an ethical relativist if that person believes that standards of right and wrong uh, depend on point of view and uh, depend on whether, uh, so, for example, the relative right and wrong, the standards of right and wrong, if, if someone claims are relative to groups or relative to uh, individuals, either way, the person is um, a, an ethical relativist, as opposed to saying that some action is right because of its nature or it's right because of its consequences. So if you say that some action is, let's say, wrong because it violates a golden rule to treat people the way you want to be treated, or if you say it's wrong because it's socially destructive, it'll undermine trust and confidence, or that it'll tend to produ uh, produce more social conflict than it will prevent, or more suffering than it will prevent. If someone says any of that, to the extent that someone fully believes those things, the person's not a thoroughgoing cultural relativist. But in any event, Benedict, uh, in, at one point of her career, defended a form of cultural relativism. Again, this is called Anthropology and the Abnormal. So let me, uh, let me just quote from this and talk about it. From uh, most, of, excuse me, most of the simpler cultures did not gain the wide currency of the one which, out of our experience, we identify with human nature. But this was for various historical reasons, and certainly not for any that gives us, uh, as its carriers, a monopoly of social good or of social sanity. Modern civilization, from this point of view, becomes not a necessary pinnacle of human achievement, but one entry in a long series of possible adjustments. These adjustments, whether they, they are in mannerisms like the ways of showing anger or joy or grief in any society, or in major human drives like those of sex, prove to be far more variable than experience in any one culture would suggest. Okay, and then later she says, in how far 
uh, are such categories culturally determined or in how far can we with assurance regard them as absolute? And then it, she says, in how far can we regard uh, inability to function socially as diagnostic of abnormality or in how far is it necessary to regard this as a function of the culture? And then she gives us what she considers spectacular illustrations of the extent to which normality may be culturally defined. And she talks about a recent study of an island of northwest uh, Melanesia by Fortune. Uh, by, okay, this is a person studying uh, uh, cult, far flung cultures. Describes a society built upon traits which we regard as beyond the border of paranoia. Or paranoia. In this tribe, the exogamic groups, those would be groups that. Um, that are marrying outside the tribe. So, for example, if a Jewish person marries a Roman Catholic person, there's a sense in which you could say that's an exogamic marriage or an exogamous marriage. So, anyway, so in this tribe, the exogamic groups look upon each as prime manipulators of black mar magic, so that one marries uh, always into an enemy group, <clears throat> which remains for life one's deadly and unappeasable foes. They look upon a good garden crop as a confession of theft, for everyone is engaged in making magic to induce into his garden the uh, productiveness of his neighbors. Therefore, no secrecy in the island is so rigidly insisted upon as the secrecy of a man's harvesting of his yams. Their polite phrase at the acceptance of a gift is, and if you now poison me, how shall I repay you this present? The preoccupation with poisoning is constant. No woman ever leaves her cooking pot for a moment unattended. Okay, so that's interesting. And then, and then uh, she goes on. Fortune describes, uh, uh, this, is, this is also uh, a very peculiar behavior by our standards. Fortune describes the individual who was regarded by all his fellows as crazy. He was not one of those who periodically ran amok and beside himself and frothing at the mouth, fell with a knife upon anyone he could reach. Such behavior they did not regard as putting anyone outside the pale. They did not even put the individuals who were known uh, to be liable to these attacks under any kind of control. They merely fled when they saw the attack coming on and kept out of the way. He would be all right tomorrow. But there was one man of sunny, kindly disposition who liked work and liked to be helpful. The compulsion was too strong for him to, um, to repress it in favor of the opposite tendencies of his culture. Men and women never spoke of him without laughing. He was silly and simple and definitely crazy. Nonetheless, in the ethnologist, in other words, someone who studies culture, uh, used uh, to a, a culture, used to culture, that has in Christianity made this type the model of all virtue, he seemed a pleasant fellow. Okay. So somebody's running amok and, and among some tribe and just almost like randomly ki killing people, uh, wounding them, possibly killing them. And according to uh, this, this view of, uh, of Benedict and some other anthropologists, well, that's quite normal in that culture. And who are we to question what they regard as normal. Okay, so then, then she says, uh, the, the, and she gives us other uh, very, very unusual examples by our standards. And then at the bottom of uh, page five, uh, 515, she says, normality in short with, within a very wide range is culturally defined. It is primarily a term for the socially elaborated segment of human behavior in any culture, an abnormality, a term for the segment that that particular civilization is not used. The very eyes with which we see the problem uh, are conditioned by the long traditional habits of our own society. And this, and then this is interesting. She goes, it is a point that has been made more often in relation to ethics and in relation to psychiatry. We do not any longer make the mistake of deriving the morality of our own locality and decade directly from the inevitable constitution of human nature. We do not elevate it to the dignity of a first principle. We recognize that morality differs in every society and is a convenient term for socially proved habits. Mankind has always preferred to say it's morally good rather than it's habitual, and the fact of this preference is, is matter enough for critical science of ethics, but historically the two phrases are synonymous. And then she goes on to say, the concept of the normal is properly a variant of the concept of the good. It is that which society has approved. 
A normal activity is one which falls within the limits of expected behavior of a particular society. Its variability among different peoples is essentially a function of the variability of the behavior patterns that different societies have created for themselves and can never be wholly divorced from consideration of culturally institutionalized type, types of behavior. Okay. Now, so what in fact is she saying? Well, she's saying that there are different ways of organizing societies. Societies have different mores, different folkways, different uh, customs. They have different circumstances, different needs, and that uh, and these evolve over time. And that uh, each society is doing its own thing. And that if we're really open-minded, we will understand that this diversity of uh, the ways in which people express their values and the diversity of uh, cultural institutions and customs. Uh, are to be expected, and that it is uh, it's kind of chauvinistic uh, and ethnocentric to believe that there's like one way in which all of us should live. There's like one blueprint for all diverse cultures. Um, okay, so, and you can understand why she's saying this, and it, and it seems to have a lot of merit. I mean, uh, certainly, let, let me just give you an example. Think of the Amish. Think of the Amish in certain parts of our country as in certain parts of Pennsylvania and some other places. And think of how they seem to do pretty well, right? They seem to be very little unemployment. They don't seem to have much crime. They seem to get along with one another. They seem to be very productive. They seem to be very respectful of one another. And yet, in certain ways, they, their ways of living are, are sharply different from those of the average American in the, more, in the wider secular culture. And are we going to say that we're right, that everybody should live as we do? Are the Amish, can the uh, Amish justifiably say that everybody should live as the Amish and have exactly the same religious beliefs, exactly the same custom? If the Amish don't value technology and higher education to the extent that the people viewing this uh, video, um, are we going to say that, well, they're wrong? Or are we going to say, well, no, maybe that works for them? Right, and then maybe what we do works for us. So that's a kind of a live and let live attitude, and it seems to make a lot of sense. And to the extent that cultural relativism is putting forward that sort of live and let live attitude, to the extent that it's recognizing that different cultures have different needs and there are different ways of organizing society without somebody only being right and everyone else is being wrong. So to the extent that it does that it seems to be uh, meritorious. It seems to uh, be making points that are sensible, right? Um, and at the same time, it seems to uh, go to what some people regard as the opposite extreme. In other words, if you notice what she's doing uh, in her essay, she's saying we no longer think that our, the, tip, the mores that we have among our particular group or culture should be universalized and they're part of essential human nature and everybody should, should follow those uh, mores. Okay, that seems to, okay, that makes sense. But it also seems to be true that she seems to be endorsing almost like another extreme, at least according to critics. I'm going to talk more about critics uh, in the next lecture. But it because it, it, it seems as if she's saying the following. Uh, it seems as if she's saying that moral norms are sort of like the rules that we have in various games, such as board games, and that we really shouldn't even talk about whether the moral norms are true or wise. We should just say those are the conventions that people adopt, and people, the rules for the game of chess, the rules for the game of Monopoly. And it's not a matter of the rules corresponding to reality or being wise. Um, uh, it's, or it's not really a matter of that uh, being true. Rather, it's those who just happen, happen to be the rules uh, for those uh, games, right? Okay, that, uh, now here's what's interesting. That view seems to imply that moral norms don't have to do essentially with uh, well, the well-being of society in any objective way. In other words, it seems possible to have cultural norms that are highly self-destructive, that, that make it very difficult for people to deal honestly and lovingly and productively and cooperatively with one another. I think, for example, to take an extreme case, 
uh, the norms of Nazi Germany. The norms of Nazi Germany uh, were such that they didn't uh, support the free and sustained use of the mind, critical thinking, individuality, uh, and instead they supported uh, violence over uh, cooperation. They, uh, instead of wanting to have more and more cooperation for mutual benefit, there was a predominant view that certain, uh, the minority should be forcing itself on various minorities to the point of enslaving them and murdering them to the tune of millions, whether it was, you know, we're talking about uh, Jewish people, and there are also uh, lots of hundreds of thousands of people, uh, other people killed, millions of Jews, but also uh, gypsies and gay people. There are a number, any political uh, dissidents and so on. Could it be uh, enslaved or killed? And so, and this, this had a lot of negative effects, obviously. Obviously, all the people who were m being mistreated, but also on the extent to which uh, there were scientists who were wanting to stick around and help the Germans. Some of the most prominent scientists were Jewish people who were either enslaved, they were enslaved or killed, or they fled Germany. Uh, and, uh, but anyway, the point is, and a number, and some of these people ended up helping uh, the United States develop the uh, atomic bomb. But anyway, my point is that um, if you think of uh, moral norms as having uh, uh, in, uh, important social functions, such as to some degree helping us get along with one another, as helping us reduce, prevent social conflict, as helping us reduce, prevent suffering, then at least theoretically, one could evaluate some moral code according to how well it fulfills these goals. Okay, and so in in that particular case, if you have people who are tr constantly trying to poison one another in some tribe, and it makes it very difficult for them to uh, be economically productive and to have successful crops, um, and that's going to cause a lot of suffering. And so it seems to me that it would be legitimate to say, yeah, that may be their norms, doesn't mean that those are wise, doesn't mean they shouldn't be criticized, okay? Uh, or think of, uh, you know, as people say, yes, we shouldn't be ethnocentric in the sense that we shouldn't think that whatever norms we have in our culture, that automatically all of them should be followed by other cultures. And, and, then, and even that we, should, we have the right to impose those norms on others, which would be a form of cultural imperialism. No, I agree with that. And, we, and I agree that we shouldn't think that, uh, that the Amish, just because he lived differently from the ordinary uh, American who's in the, in the broader, more secular culture, uh, that somehow they're wrong, and, and you know, it's, I understand that. I understand that there are many different ways of organizing uh, life and cultures, and that there can be many different acceptable ways. But it also seems to be true, at least according to the critics of cultural relativism, that it is a, a mistake to think that whatever is well accepted in a culture at a given place and time can fully determine what is really morally right in that culture. Now, it may determine what people all widely consider right, but someone says, but maybe it's not really right, because maybe it it's mistreats uh, whole groups of people. And so it seems, if you do believe that it makes sense to have moral norms that help us get along with one another rather than doing the reverse, that helps us build trust rather than undermine it, that helps us reduce suffering uh, rather than increasing it, that helps us reduce social conflict rather than increasing it. If you do believe that, then you're not some sort of uh, thoroughgoing or unqualified cultural relativist. So um, this, that, these are some of the standard criticisms of cultural relativism. Let me give you another example. If you have uh, a tribe and the members of the tribe believe erroneously that masturbation is uh, harmful, medically harmful, that it could cause, uh, let's say, insanity. That it, and by the way, there are even some learned people who believe that in the 1800s. You could look up masturbatory insanity on Google, and you can find out that a lot of learned uh, people in the 19th century believed that it was harmful, medically harmful, uh, and that uh, it, there are a lot of interesting stories about this. But my point is that suppose some tribe erroneously believes that masturbation is uh, dangerous, and so they condemn it because of that. Well, someone could say, well, okay, that's understandable, but if, they, if it is brought to their attention that it's not dangerous, 
uh, then and if they uh, then if they're rational, they'd say, okay, then we were wrong to condemn it. If we condemned it on the ground that we thought it was dangerous and we were wrong, okay. But what's interesting about cultural relativism in its unqualified form is it seems to imply that even when someone erroneously believe, condemns something because the person believes erroneously it's harmful, that that can still make the action harmful. Uh, I shouldn't say harmful, but it can make it morally wrong in that society. In other words, it identifies right and wrong simply with the, uh, the opinions that people have in a given time and in a, in a different in a, a given place. And so some people think, well, that really seems to be very arbitrary. Um, and sometimes people can be uh, incorrect about the real consequences of behavior, and they can condemn something that, that is harmless, right? And so, uh, so the idea that whatever the majority endorse at a given place and time will automatically make something right or wrong is something that has been subject to serious criticism. And again, the, what I want you to get from this is there seem, there seem to be uh, ideas that are of, of merit within cultural relativism because it seems correct that it's a mistake to think there's just one way for everyone to live and that there couldn't be varieties of uh, customs and ways to live in different cultures, okay? And that it cautions against ethnocentrism, the belief that one's group is, is superior to others and everyone should emulate that group. Okay, that's fine. But it seems that uh, besides doing those things that, I, that at least I think are, are good, it also seems to embody a belief that, that cultural norms, that the moral norms within a culture uh, can have, don't have to have any rational basis at all. They can even be grounded on misconceptions, such as the belief that masturbation is dangerous. Um, and that, that uh, seems to be a logical implication of the theory. And it seems to imply that, if you want to take an extreme example, that if in, in uh, Nazi Germany, if the majority of people oppose of, uh, the genocide of uh, peaceful minorities and they institutionalize that genocide, have laws and customs for it, uh, then somehow that makes that morally right in that culture. Not simply considered morally right, morally right but actually makes it morally right. And that is a very controversial view at, that has been subject to serious criticism. Next lecture, we're going to look at a philosopher's criticism, <coughs> excuse me, of uh, cultural relativism, and especially its ethical component, holding that, that standards of right and wrong are created by, dependent on, and relative to each culture.